I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, a vote in Carlsbad tonight could clear the way for new development, but not everyone is in favor of the plan. And I'm Peggy Pico with an in-depth look at how the new Climate Change Center in San Diego will move forward on adapting to climate change in our region and who they want to hire to help. And San Diego researchers say a surprising number of Mexico sex trade workers are forced into the business as teenagers. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Major gaps in California's information security system. The state auditor says many agencies are vulnerable to a security breach. She says only four out of 77 agencies have fully complied with state security standards. Many also have not sufficiently planned for interruptions or disasters, leaving social security numbers, health information, or even tax returns at risk of being hacked. An update tonight on the North County Transit District and a story we've been following since 2012. A jury rejected claims of sex and age discrimination from a former HR employee. News Source reporter Brad Racino joins us with the latest developments. Brad, remind us how this lawsuit came about and why you stayed on top of it for so long. The case concerned a former human resources employee at North County Transit District, Virginia Moeller, who sued the transit agency in 2013, claiming she was laid off years prior due to her age and gender. And while that's really not an uncommon claim, you see lawsuits like this all the time, the thing that made this case newsworthy was really the sheer volume of ex-employees who came to Moeller's defense by making similar claims. And you spoke with several jurors for this story. What did they tell you? To be clear, I spoke with several, but only one wanted to be quoted directly. He told me the jury was a bit torn, that they believed a lot of what Moeller and her supporters were saying, but that in the end, there was no hard evidence she was laid off because of her age or gender. Joshua Silva, one of the jurors, told me, yeah, well, we, we all believe there are some things going on at the agency that may not be on the up and up, but that's not what we were asked to decide on. And NCTD, he said, presented a really strong case. Did North County Transit District have anything to say about all this? They did for the first time in a long time. I spoke with Tony Kranz. He's an Encinitas councilman and an NCTD board member. He told me he wasn't surprised by the outcome of this case, but he was disappointed how much money the agency had to spend to defend itself against what he thought of as a manufactured lawsuit. He also said the ex-employees who were lobbying claims against the agency and its CEO, Matthew Tucker, were just disgruntled. I news source reporter, Brad Racino. Carlsbad neighbors rallied outside City Hall ahead of tonight's council vote on a proposal to build a new mall next to the Agua Jariendo, uh, in Jariendo Lagoon. The developer plans to preserve much of the lagoon as open space and build an open-air shopping center on 15 percent of the land there. Opponents want to put it on the ballot for a special election. That could cost half a million dollars. The meeting is expected to last late into tonight. U.S. home prices rising. A key housing report shows home prices rose solidly in June, up more than 4.5% last month in San Diego. Standard & Poor's Case-Shiller Index rose 5% overall from a year earlier. Analysts say it's another sign of renewed health in the housing market. The climb in San Diego is the fourth fastest in the U.S. behind Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Washington, D.C. It's been a day of ups and downs on Wall Street. Traders rode a rally for most of the day. Then the market retreated in the final hour. Minutes before the closing bell, gains evaporated. The Dow closed 205 points lower. Global markets were calmer following China's decision to cut its interest rates for the fifth time in nine months. In one of the first studies of its kind, UC San Diego researchers say many girls are forced into the sex industry as teenagers in Mexico. Peggy Pico tells us what's being done to protect young sex trafficking victims. 
Researchers found one in four female sex workers in Tijuana and Ciudad Juarez say they entered the sex trade in their teens. Joining me with details are my guest, Professor Jay Silverman, author of the UC San Diego study published in this month's Journal of the American Medical Association, and Alma Tucker, founder of La Casa del Jardín, a safe house for sex trade victims in Tijuana. And Jay, tell us more about your findings. Uh, how many sex trade girls were part of the study, and uh, what did the study reveal? Uh, a little over 600 uh, women and girls were interviewed in uh, Tijuana and Ciudad Juarez. And as you said, one in four, a little over one in four uh, of the participants reported entering the sex trade before they were 18. Actually, one in eight reported entering when they were ages 15 or, or younger. We had girls who were as young as 11 or 12. What are some of the specific risks to teen sex workers as opposed to adult sex workers? Well, the, the, that's a, it's a really important question. The, what we found was, although violence is certainly something that all people in the sex trade are at risk for, the violence suffered by these people who came in uh, as minors, these young girls, was far, far higher. In fact, one in five of these girls reported being violently victimized uh, and to make them have sex with male clients. Uh, they, one in five of them reported that uh, they had to have sex with very high numbers, more than 10 clients uh, a day in their first month in sex work. And very importantly, in terms of disease, a full third of them coming in as children reported not being able to use uh, condoms at all uh, to protect themselves from pregnancy or from HIV. Subsequently, we see a tremendously uh, high prevalence of, of HIV infection among this, this high-risk group, this group who came in as children, where uh, just about 6% of them were HIV infected, which is much, much higher than we see for the general population. And Alma, you run Casa del Jardín, the only shelter for sex trade victims in Tijuana. What do the victims tell you about what they've experienced? Well, um, th at, at that age, they, know that they don't even identify their being abused. We have a child, nine year and 10 year old, and when they came to the shelter, two to six months to really identify themselves as a victims. And, uh, and after those six months, they say, Alma, before I came to this house, I didn't knew then that what's happening to me was abuse. They kind of normalize, they think it's normal. Then uh, it's, it's a lot of guiltiness, it's a lot of shame, it's, they're afraid, and mostly because the people who are taking advantage of them is somebody very close to them. Sometimes they their own family, and, uh, and it's somebody that they trust. Then it takes time to rebuild that confidence in others. So the people closest to them have introduced them into the sex trade uh, business. How does the center help them? Well, we'll provide all kinds of services, the basic ones from uh, home, clothes, uh, medical assistant, legal assistant, psychology, therapies, and um, an attorney. We, we uh, advise them in any legal matters that they're involved. And um, most of everything, we encourage them to do sports and activities because there's so much pain that they're going through, then, then they really need to, to get into their feet and, uh, and learn other ways. So we have children, and they come to the house, and they don't know how to read and write because they haven't taken them out of schools to make them ignorant and not to well known that what is happening to them is abuse. And, and Jay, sex trafficking, of course, we know happens on both sides of the borders. What protections are here to help victims? Well, here, the, most of the, the programs that we have here uh, in Tijuana and elsewhere relate to the really criminal justice system. It tends to be after the fact. That said, uh, there are several uh, smaller programs that do assist uh, victims who have been identified on this side of the border. Unfortunately, on the other side of the border, uh, although the problem is huge, uh, Casa de Jardín is the only um, program, and that's not a coincidence. It's very, very, very hard work to do that. Uh, surprisingly, very few people have lined up to support. It's also, as you know, a tremendously profitable business, and so some of the most powerful constituents uh, are not particularly supportive of programs to really reduce uh, this issue. So it's a tremendous challenge. How would you like to see this study used to help the problem resolve? I would like to see this study used, uh, one, to break down barriers that people have to say this is just an anecdote, uh, we don't really know how many. These, we're talking about thousands uh, of young girls who are being uh, violently victimized. Uh, I'd, we'd like to see that 
situate the systems such as uh, child protection, foster care, juvenile justice, uh, the health care sectors, dealing with vulnerable girls, such as girls who are becoming pregnant at young ages, really be poised to help identify uh, those girls who are vulnerable uh, to f falling into the cracks of being exploited, uh, often by male partners, uh, to uh, really be sold for sex at young ages. This is something that we need to focus on prevention. All right, Jay Silverman and Alma Tucker, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Gas prices around San Diego County continue to drop today. The average price for a gallon of self-serve regular is down uh, nearly three cents to three dollars and sixty cents a gallon. Today is the 11th consecutive day we've seen a decrease. Defense contractors from around the country are meeting in San Diego for the annual Navy Gold Coast Conference. While defense contracting work has slowed since 2012, areas such as cybersecurity provide uh, opportunities even as the overall defense budget continues to shrink. I think we see a lot of them coming in. They, you know, a lot of the companies are staying smaller longer and some of them are, you know, evaporating. Uh, the market is tenuous, but for good company, there's opportunities to excel. That's one of the things we're doing here. You know, we not just have small companies here, but we got large companies looking to do business with them. Among the most challenging issue for large and small companies is navigating the federal bureaucracy. The Navy says they're aware of the challenge. I think a lot of this is about connecting up the right dots, uh, that a, a need and a capability that we need over here, and who has that, uh, that skill set, the company that has that skill set to be able to fulfill the things that we need. I think in a lot of cases, it's just making sure that they know what we need, and in turn, us knowing who's available and getting the word to those people. This is the largest event of its kind in the country. More than 1,300 people are scheduled to attend the two-day conference at the convention center through Wednesday. Reporting water waste just got easier with the launch of a smartphone app from the County Water Authority. Neighbors can report those wasting water through things like broken sprinklers and excessive uh, irrigation. Uh, it's called When in Drought Report Waste app. It allows users to transmit photographs or video. SDG&E was able to produce a little over 1,000 megawatts of renewable electricity on its power grid last week. Bright sunshine, strong winds in San Diego and Imperial Valley helped to generate the record-setting green energy. That includes energy produced by 61,000 rooftop solar customers. An attack on a funeral home in Tijuana left two people dead, several people injured, and mourners scrambling. The victims were reportedly attending a wake for two people shot last week at a tire shop. Casings from an AK-47 were found at the scene. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour. Our series, Katrina 10 Years Later, continues as we return to one of the hardest hit areas, New Orleans' Lower Ninth Ward. That's Tuesday on the PBS News Hour. Tonight, we take a closer look at a story we brought you last night how engineers and other specialists will be used in a new climate center in San Diego. Peggy Pico explains what's in store. UC San Diego and Scripps Institution of Oceanography launched the new Climate Change Center on Monday. The cross-disciplinary team will focus on finding ways to adapt to climate change in our region and beyond. Here with what that may look like is my guest, Scripps Institution of Oceanography Director Margaret Leinen. And Margaret, there's no building attached to this new center. Uh, why go with this decentralized approach? The most important thing in this area is not only climate impacts and adaptation, but how interdisciplinary they are. It's going to require an approach that in includes engineering, social science, economics, policy, etc. And so we don't want to create another set of walls by putting people in a separate building or pushing them away from everyone else. We really want everyone at UCSD to work with us on this challenging problem. So logistically, how will that work? Will there be teams or phone calls or do we know yet? Uh, we're still working on it, but 
uh, I think that we'll certainly have teams of people. Um, within a university, there's lots of collaboration, and we have, we have a lot of expertise at doing that. But this is a larger scale involving more of the university. Well, now, I understand that the center is moving beyond proving that climate change exists or its mm -hmm. likely consequences and actually going on to adaptation strategies. Could you give us a few examples or some ideas of some things scientists might make practically or come up with as far as adaptation strategies here in San Diego? Sure. One of the things that we're concerned about is sea level rise. So every uh, California coastal community has to have a sea level rise adaptation plan. But the question is, how much do we have to plan for and what's going to happen? And that's an area where Scripps oceanographers have been doing work for a long time to understand the impacts of erosion on coastal cliffs or um, seawater coming up during flooding times and being able to give uh, San Diego planners information about the specific levels of, uh, of challenge that they'll have will be very valuable. And that might work out to, oh, we need a seawall here or we need reinforcement here, or, we need roads built here, things like that. Or even more important, what do we do with our sewer system? Or what about the buildings in downtown San Diego? Are their basements going to flood with big storms or not? Uh, those kinds of questions can really help us avoid a lot of trouble. So why move forward on this now, adapting to climate change uh, instead of waiting for later? Why today? It's because we already see the impacts of climate change. We haven't seen uh, much sea level rise here, but if we were in Fort Lauderdale or Norfolk, uh, Virginia, or even Louisiana, we'd be definitely seeing it. So let's get prepared. Uh, if it's happening elsewhere, um, it's, it's likely to happen here too. In a, what are you doing as far as uh, public education and outreach uh, through the center? Is that part of the program? It's definitely part of the program. And it's important that people are aware of what's coming and have a lot of time to plan for it. So that means that our uh, outreach people, our education experts uh, can work with us to bring that message not only to planners or government officials, but to the rest of us who are sitting back there saying, how soon do I have to worry about this? Now you're actually looking for a director for the center. I know that's underway and there are other job openings as well. Can you give us an idea of what kinds of uh, people yes. you're looking for for those jobs? We have eight new faculty positions uh, that are associated with the center. Each one of them will be an interdisciplinary position between two different fields. So for example, we'll have people that work in human health and climate change impacts. So they might work with Scripps Oceanography, they might work with engineering. Uh, then we'll also have uh, positions in the area of ecosystems, marine ecosystems, that's certainly one of our strengths, but also land ecosystems. How are they going to change and what will that do to agriculture, forestry, um, you know, our backyards and so forth. Sure, some new opportunities there. And then we have uh, positions that will fill in the area of hazards. So we've been talking about some hazards, sea level rise, drought, flood, those sorts of things. And policy, how does that work? And then finally, we'll also have positions that are in sensors or measurements or observations. How do we quantify this and make sure that we're accurate about it? So a real broad spectrum yes. and they can uh, look it up on the website there for as far as more information on that. Scripps Institution of Oceanography's Margaret Leinen, thank you so much. You're welcome. Some state lawmakers are pushing for a ban on fracking, delivering 150,000 signed petitions today to the governor. Oil companies have been fracking in California more than 60 years. A recent report says the chemicals in water used for fracking could be contaminating the state's groundwater. Some lawmakers say the report is not as thorough as they hoped and California might not be ready for a statewide ban. The state of California uh, is in a reactive mode right now. While I support a full ban on fracking, at a minimum, uh, we need to focus on a moratorium so the scientific community can get the answers that residents deserve. Critics of a fracking ban say it could cost the state hundreds of jobs and force the state to look elsewhere for its fuel needs. 
Cattle breeders in Ireland are teaming up with a San Diego company to improve the breeding of livestock. Illumina was chosen to collect the genes of cows. Ranchers traditionally eyeball their herd for desirable traits, but Illumina says their genomics program will provide faster and more accurate data. The company says Ireland could be the first country in the world to genotype the entire national herd. Fitness in a box. Community demand at the new YMCA in City Heights is creating the need to expand on the rooftop of the 53,000 square foot facility where the old Pearson Ford dealership used to be on El Cajon Boulevard. The Copley Price Family Y opened seven months ago with a state-of-the-art fitness center, outdoor pools and a preschool and child care facilities. Sid Vivek with the Y says capacity was becoming an issue. Outdoor facilities like this, uh, not unusual. But here in City Heights, we're in one of the most impacted communities in San Diego. And to give the folks of City Heights and neighboring communities the opportunity uh, for this sort of cutting edge fitness technology uh, and experience, um, we're just proud to be able to provide that and make it accessible to all. The new rooftop fitness center is attracting people of all ages and ethnicities. It's mobile and can be boxed up with all of its equipment to make way for other activities at the Y. Sports stadiums in the U.S. are more than just a place to watch the game. They're great places to eat, but where, uh, but where does all that food come from and what happens to the waste? KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman tells us how San Diego Padres are setting an example for sporting venues around the country. It's 7.30 a.m. on game day at Petco Park, and the food trucks have just started rolling in. As part of his daily routine, executive chef Carlos Vargas awaits the fresh produce. Let's, do the, let's start rolling all the product out. The food is local. During homestands, Melissa's Produce, based out of Los Angeles, and Susie's Farm here in San Diego, make daily deliveries full of fresh vegetables and fruits. See the quality of the raspberries that we have in here? It's just... Unbelievable how good and sweet they are. The Padres and concession partner Delaware North were recognized as champions of game day food in a joint report by the Natural Resources Defense Council and the Green Sports Alliance. The report named Petco Park as one of the top locations for stadium eats in the country for their sustainability efforts and food quality. Alan Hershowitz is president of the Green Sports Alliance. The Padres uh, are providing uh, valuable lessons not only to uh, professional sports venues throughout North America, but actually uh, professional sports venues throughout the world. Over 95% of the San Diego Padres concession stands and restaurants get their food from Southern California. Scott Marshall is vice president and chief hospitality officer for the Padres. He says food has become a major ballpark attraction. We've seen just an overall uh, uh, increase in food sales because people people are coming to the ballpark earlier to have a meal. They're staying later. Uh, you know, so typically sometimes uh, our locations would normally close at the seventh inning. We're seeing that go beyond the game because people are are, are want to have that food experience. That food experience includes 15 local restaurants that have set up shop in the stadium's concourse giving Padre fans a unique taste of San Diego. What we found by bringing and introducing Hodads was we started something uh, very special. And uh, from that, the floodgates kind of opened and we had uh, Phil's come in, we had Seaside Market come in, Rimmel's, Zembu, Pizza Port, and we really put you know, kind of a taste of San Diego here at the ballpark. Getting local food reduces what environmentalists call food miles costs and resources used when transporting food. Chef Vargas says there is a noticeable freshness using local vendors. He adds that traditional concessions like nachos, hamburgers, and hot dogs come locally as well, with the hot dogs coming from just outside Chula Vista. And the company is Tarantino's, you know, and that's where we actually buy all of our sausages and then all of our, uh, our Friar Frank dog, you know, that's our actual dog here for the stadium. But what happens to the food that doesn't get eaten? What's still good is donated to local shelters, while the rest is diverted away from landfills and reused. The Padres have 20 ongoing waste reduction initiatives targeting all aspects of the ballpark. John McAvoy is director of facility services for the Padres. He says in addition to recycling food and grass clippings for mulch, they also create biodiesel with an Escondido-based company. Western Biofuels comes in, they take all of our used cooking oil, and they turn it into biodiesel. 
we actually use about 125 gallons of that is used back in the tractors that we use on the, on the field for mowing the grass throughout the season. The Padres waste diversion rate is currently at 77 percent, with plans for 80 percent by the end of 2015. For KPBS News, I'm Matt Hoffman. Well, it was short-lived, but many areas around the county saw some rain today, or at least sprinkles, and not just in the mountains. It was from high pressure moving through our region. Along with uh, those showers came some measurable humidity. In fact, the uh, weather forecast over the next few days, uh, increasing humidity from the coast inland. Coastal temperatures under a mix of mostly clouds, mid-80s. Inland temperatures uh, much warmer. We're looking at upper 90s, and you see that on Friday, 100 degrees. Mountain areas cloudy, windy tomorrow, but uh, sun returns on Thursday and Friday, upper 80s. And no change for the desert. Triple digits heating up to 110 on Friday. Here's a look at uh, what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom on Morning Edition. Thousands of pairs of shoes are on display representing the number of homeless people in our county. And on KPBS Midday Edition, starting this year, students in Mesa College don't have to leave campus to get a four-year degree in health information management. We'll tell you all about that tomorrow at noon on KPBS Radio. Of course, you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night.